Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, Frost and Sullivan and why we're here to talk about digitization and agriculture, we're an industry research and consulting company uh, specializing in the IT industry. Uh, we've been in operation for about 40 years and, and over that time we've built strong relationships with many of the big vendors in the information and communications technology sector, companies like Telstra, IBM, Cisco and so on. Now five to ten years ago none of these companies really were very interested in agriculture as an end market, an industry vertical as they call it, for their products or services. Uh, but over the past five to ten years we've noticed a dramatic shift, particularly I'd say over the past two or three years, where agriculture along with healthcare is one of the two industry sectors that information communication technology vendors are really focusing on as an end market for their products and services. And so we've worked extensively uh, over recent years with many of these vendors to help to review, assess and identify market opportunities for their technologies in this sector. But what I'd like to talk about today is some of the factors that we think are driving uh, the use of digital change or digital technology in the agriculture sector, as well as perhaps talking about some of the barriers that we still we think still exist in the sector that perhaps are impeding adoption to a greater and faster extent. Uh, but perhaps more interestingly, I'm also going to talk about many of the use cases that we've seen of how digital technology is being used in various segments of agriculture to actually drive real change in terms of increased yields, increased farm efficiency uh, or lower production costs. So let me talk about initially what we see as some of the main reasons why it's important that uh, digitization is used in agriculture, some of what we see as the main drivers. I'm going to talk about four to start with, the need for increased output, uh, the growing increased uh, agricultural water demand, the impact of climate change and diminishing resources. So let's talk firstly about the need for increased output. Now, um, a couple of hundred years ago, um, a British economist called Thomas Malthus made some very uh, uh, unfortunate predictions that uh, there would be very large scale starvation as population grew at a geometric rate compared to agricultural output growing only at an arithmetic rate. Now, to some extent, those uh, predictions never really came true. That there hasn't been large scale famine or large scale starvation, except at fairly localized level globally, uh, really due to the impact that technology had on the agricultural sector. Technology particularly in terms of pesticides, in terms of fertilizers and in terms of irrigation systems. So those technologies over the past uh, 100 to 200 years have really driven dramatic output uh, change in agriculture which has largely enabled agricultural output to keep pace with global population growth. Uh, but as population growth continues to increase, the ability of those technologies to support agricultural output at the margin becomes harder and harder. So the current global population is about 7.5 billion. Uh, there's going to be another 2 billion people added globally by 2050. So within 30 years, there'll be another 2 billion people. Uh, and to meet the needs of that population, um, it's estimated agricultural production will need to increase by about 70%. Uh, and as I said, the ability of existing technologies to support that growth is becoming more and more difficult. So it's really only possible to achieve that in increased output by the adoption of new technologies, such as digital technologies, to enable increased agricultural output. At the same time, as we're all aware, climate change is becoming more of an issue, uh, both in terms of the impact of, uh, of, of climate events on agricultural output, but also on the need to manage and reduce uh, agricultural emissions from the agricultural process itself. So again, digital technologies are helping to manage and reduce emissions from agriculture, as well as helping to offset some of the malign influences that some of these climate events are having. Uh, Water demand is another uh, key factor, I think, that's driving the need for digitization. Uh, globally, about 70% of fresh water is used for agriculture. Um, you know, we need something like 3,000 to 5,000 litres to produce one kilogram of rice, uh, 2,000 litres of water for one kilogram of soya, 900 litres for one kilogram of wheat, and so on. So with increasing uh, pressure on water resources, particularly here in Australia, but in many of the countries as well, uh, it's increasingly important for the agricultural sector to uh, embrace technologies that help to make the use of that water uh, most efficient. Uh, and finally, we see diminishing resources, diminishing available agricultural land, diminishing groundwater resources globally that are also putting pressure uh, on agricultural output. So again, another area why digital technology is needed to help to support uh, growth in agricultural yields. So what are, what are some of the drivers of digitization in agriculture? We see um, three or four major ones. Firstly, we see rapidly increasing awareness of the benefits of digital solutions amongst the agricultural profession. And I guess events like today are uh, an example of how uh, 
producers are becoming more embracing of the, of the benefits of uh, these kind of solutions. We're also seeing rapid increases in the use of, uh, of sensing technology and the ability of sensing technology to be deployed at scale, uh, at low cost and in rugged environments. So sensors are a key output or a, a key output mechanism, if you like, for digital technology. They're the device that uh, records uh, environmental change and provides it in a digital format. Uh, so the use of sensors uh, is really a key element in virtually any of the digital technologies I'll be talking about today. Uh, at the same time, digital technology is not necessarily cheap to implement. Some solutions can be quite expensive, and we're seeing the increasing consolidation of uh, farms, uh, not just in Australia but globally, which are providing, if you like, larger units with perhaps increased ability to fund and invest in digital solutions. Uh, and finally, uh, a new generation of farmers, um, you know, digital literacy, the, the ability to uh, embrace digital change tends to be inversely related to age. Uh, and so as younger farmers who are more digitally literate uh, take over ownership perhaps of the family farm or management roles in corporate farms, they're more willing, uh, we find, to embrace and to utilise digital technologies uh, in those uh, agricultural systems. Uh, but at the same time, there are some restraints that are still holding back more widespread uh, use of agriculture. Uh, one of the most important ones, particularly in rural and uh, regional and rural Australia, is the infrastructure gap, particularly around uh, connectivity. Uh, as I think has been already mentioned, uh, although we're a big country, the vast majority of us live in five major cities uh, and a few more large regional towns, which do have pretty good connectivity, at least by global standards. But for many other parts of the country, the connectivity is still uh, poor. Uh, NBN rollout is obviously occurring, but traditionally, uh, up to now, that's been a major barrier uh, to implementation uh, of some digital technology, uh, with many farms having very limited connectivity, or in some cases, uh, none at all. Uh, and this has tended to limit the ability of uh, many uh, agricultural uh, locations to implement digital technology, simply because you need the connectivity, which so far hasn't existed. Uh, going back to my previous point about the new generation of farmers coming through, of course, the converse of that means that there is still perhaps uh, limited digital literacy among some of the older generation of farmers uh, who are still perhaps less willing to embrace digital technology or more suspicious of it. Uh, and particularly in, for, in smaller scale holdings, they may lack the ability or the capacity to afford uh, to invest in, in, in agricultural solutions. Uh, and there may also be a lack of trust in technology vendors uh, overall. And what we're seeing often is uh, uh, difficulty in interoperability between different solutions and often uh, farmers are adopting point solutions for different uh, uh, parts of, the, of their farming system which often are unable to talk to each other in an inter interoperable way. So this lack of interoperability can be a major challenge in terms of transferring data from one piece of equipment uh, to another. So there's some of the restraints that we see that are still holding back perhaps more widespread adoption of digital technologies in, in agriculture. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing really is a convergence of enabling technologies uh, that I'll talk about in more detail that are really coming together to enable a more holistic uh, digital farm to be established. And these technologies really involve a range of, uh, of uh, things such as um, the use of drones, robots on the farm, uh, different agricultural produce production systems, and particularly widespread use of sensors, collecting huge amounts of data which can now for the first time perhaps in, in, um, in, a, in a rural situation, given the connectivity improvements uh, be collected and managed uh, in what's called the cloud. Uh, you know, remote uh, servers are located uh, well off the, uh, the farm premises where data can be stored uh, and the use of uh, technology such as big data analytics and artificial intelligence to enable farmers to make more intelligent business decisions from that data. So this convergence of enabling technologies is coming together really to enable uh, more intelligent decisions to be made about farm management. And there's really quite a host of these technologies uh, that are coming available uh, in, in the farming situation. Now, none of these technologies are really agricultural specific. They're technologies that are being applied across a broad range of industry sectors. Uh, but increasingly, we're finding they're finding adoption in the agricultural sector. And they range, for example, uh, from the use of drones, um, robotics, machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications, predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, cloud computing, uh, uh, navigational uh, systems, and wireless sensors. None of these are specific to the agricultural sector. They're technologies that have often been developed for other applications, uh, other industry verticals by large vendors, uh, and in some cases even by small vendors. But we're finding them becoming much more widely uh, rolled out in, in agricultural processes. Uh, enhancing productivity, improving yield, and helping to reduce production costs in, in the farming system. 
So where are these technologies being used uh, in, in, in the farms? Well, we see them actually being used in quite a wide range uh, of agricultural use cases. Um, examples would include, for example, um, grain silo monitoring, where a wireless sensor um, can be used to monitor crops stored in grain bins, uh, measuring things like carbon dioxide, uh, VOCs, temperature, humidity, and so on. Uh, they're used in greenhouse monitoring as uh, uh, greenhouse um, uh, horticulture becomes a more important and growing part of the, hortic of the um, uh, horticultural system in many countries. Uh, they're used in what we might call autonomous farming. Um, that's farm vehicles vehicles, farm equipment that uh, can operate without a driver, the use of drones, the use of robotics and so on. So across quite a broad range of, of um, agricultural areas, these technologies have been deployed uh, for really quite a broad range of use cases uh, for monitoring crop yield, soil analysis, uh, monitoring soil monitor, uh, moisture, estimating crop water requirements, disease detection, and so on and so forth. And what I'll talk about in a moment is some more specific uh, examples of how these kind of technologies are being used in a farming or an agricultural environment to address a particular challenge or a particular area of concern uh, that the farmer or the agriculturalist may have. For example, let's talk about the first case study, the use of what we call agribots. So what's an agribot? It's an, a digitized, uh, an automated machine that can perform a wide range of agricultural tasks uh, with high efficiency. Um, areas, for example, like flower or fruit counting, harvesting and fruit picking, cattle herding, milk collection, and so on, as well as some emerging applications for agribots in areas like weed control, pest surveillance, cloud seeding, planting, uh, and so on. And, and some of the, um, the ways that these um, pr uh, products have been used so far Far have led to some quite significant uh, examples of return on investment. Uh, for example, 10 times plus um, productivity improvements using robotic harvesters uh, compared to manual processes uh, while ensuring uh, minimal fruit damage and wastage, or a 90% uh, reduction in water consumption through the use of automated hydrophonic growing systems. So what we see going forward is that these agribots are going to become more widely adopted as uh, haptic sensors, for example, pr enable the use of robotic arms which have a sense of touch, uh, force and pressure, uh, more advanced decision support uh, and intelli uh, artificial intelligence systems, and even self-charging robots that have improved battery life for longer operational time. Uh, Australia is a leading producer, you may not know this actually, but it is a leading producer of uh, drones and particularly a strong industry in Queensland. Uh, and along with the resource sector, the agricultural sector is quite an important end market for drones. Uh, they're being used in areas like crop yield monitoring, livestock tracking, uh, forestry, uh, fertilizer distribution and automated spraying of uh, pesticides and so on. Uh, and we see also some emerging applications in areas like uh, disease prediction, um, scanning for nutri nutrient deficiencies and so on. Uh, so again, some quite compelling examples of return on investment, um, cost effective, more cost effective and more detailed imaging options compared to on the ground surveys. Uh, the use of drones for, for example, for infrared mapping, it's significantly cheaper than satellites. Uh, and we see going forward, drones are becoming um, you know, uh, more widely used uh, for beyond um, visual line of sight operations as they become uh, more permitted. So we're certainly seeing drones as, uh, again, an important aspect of the use of digital technologies in agriculture. Uh, another example is what we might call microclimate sensors, which enhance the effectiveness of agricultural systems, uh, providing detailed and accurate information on the farm. Um, and as a result of the use of these sensors, we're seeing the emergence of uh, much more advanced and sophisticated data management and analytical solutions that make uh, farmers uh, able to make better decisions. So currently they're used in areas like measuring rain, uh, wind, speed and direction, leaf wetness, relative humidity and so on. Uh, but we see them uh, becoming more widely adopted across a wider range of crops, across greenhouses and even across turf growing, particularly used in combination with other sensors. Some examples of ROI, um, uh, a number of vineyards, for example, have reported the need to reduce spraying by about 20% uh, when microclimate sensors are used to measure humidity and temperature, uh, and the identification of, of sections of crops which require the usage of relevant uh, chemicals or water means the entire crop doesn't have to be uh, um, uh, supplied with those, uh, with those inputs, uh, you know, reducing water and chemical usage. So certainly we see going forward the uptake of uh, wireless microclimate sensing particularly. We expect to gather momentum over the next two or three years. There's quite a broad range of industry participants who are uh, introducing both individual uh, sensor types but also more holistic solutions for a variety of agricultural uh, end markets. 
The Internet of Things, or the IoT platform, is perhaps the overlaying platform uh, that uh, enables all the connectivity all of all of these sensors, and we're seeing the use of IoT solutions across quite a broad range of broad acre crops and, and horticulture segments as well. Uh, for example, the use of IoT on an average farm can increase yield uh, whilst reducing energy costs and water use. Uh, and we're certainly seeing as connectivity improves, much greater usage of IoT platforms, including sensors and the analytics behind them uh, across a broad range of agricultural segments. So let's talk about some more specific uh, individual case studies on a sort of a named basis. Um, some of you may be aware of a company called Kagomi. It's a big tomato processor, uh, not too far away. I think it's in rural Victoria, uh, who had a problem around long tr truck queues at uh, weigh bridges uh, during the harvesting process at their factory in Echuca using paper-based documentation. They've implemented uh, RFID-based technology uh, for fast, paperless, uh, automated identification of tomatoes on the trucks, which has reduced the average waiting time from 12 to 2 minutes. Uh, and the driver is no longer required to exit the truck at Weybridge, uh, also leading not just to improved efficiency, but also to improve quality control. Um, microclimate sensors have been used at various wineries and, and even oyster farms uh, to um, uh, uh, improve the ability to reduce response times to adverse events such as frost conditions in vineyards or disease outbreaks in oyster farms. Uh, both of those can obviously be a major challenge to the, to the vineyard or to the oyster farm. Uh, and these kind of sensing um, uh, measurements are used in areas like water, temperature, depth, barometric pressure and so on to more accurately predict some kind of adverse event. So, an example in, in aquaculture, um, this can re or has reduced uh, unnecessary harvest closures by 30% by improving uh, the reliability of data. Uh, and for agricultural and, and vineyard applications, uh, these technologies can help to reduce notifications and help with a digital record around uh, irrigation spraying compliance and so on. If we move on to other examples around the use of robotics, um, uh, for example, for example, around the uh, Swan Farm Robotics, who needed to improve productivity in planting, weed and pest control, uh, who've used lightweight mini sensor guided autonomous robotic vehicles operating in swarms, uh, providing them for a, for a monthly fee, which has enabled improved consistency, uh, flexibility and cost efficiency compared with uh, manual operations or indeed uh, larger and, and more uh, autonomous robots. If we look at the use of drones or geospatial mapping, um, drone, for example, a trial between uh, Queensland University of Technology, Agriculture Victoria and the Plant Biosecurity CRC, which has looked at the detection and management of grapevine pests, which is currently expensive and time consuming, using uh, typically undertaken at the moment using ground surveys and ground traps. Uh, they're investigating the use of drones using hyperspectral cameras and artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, which enables the uh, classification of the individual hyperspectral signatures of the vine. So it's quite a technical, di technically difficult process to uh, detect and manage grapevine pest uh, in a non-manual way, uh, but this technology has the potential ability to significantly improve uh, the surveillance and management of pests in a vineyard. Uh, geospatial mapping is being used in um, applications such as those provided by FarmMap 4D, uh, which address some of the challenges, you know, of the small size of the rangeland workforce, inadequate communication infrastructure, and often lack of technical know-how amongst land managers, uh, to provide outcomes like quicker analysis and quicker reporting on seasonal trends in ground cover within a paddock or a property, uh, resulting in labour savings, improved pasture utilisation, improved profitability, and greater sustainability. And I'll just finish on one more particular uh, case study that we're aware of uh, in the area of IoT or Internet of Things, uh, a partnership between Australian Country Choice, Australian Cattle and Beef Holdings and Meat and Livestock Australia and Hitachi, uh, which have looked at integrating data from weather stations, soil moisture probes, water trough monitors, cameras and sensors to provide a more holistic uh, approach to farm management. Uh, and some of the results of those trials have led to improved quality of insights to support better breeding decisions and better farm management decisions. So it's an example, if you like, of a holistic IoT solution using sensors, uh, big data analytics and artificial intelligence to help to drive improvements in the way that farms are managed. So when we look at um, you know, the ways that this digitization uh, benefit can be quantified, uh, 
Uh, there are a range of increasingly um, valid uh, examples from both trials but also practical uh, operational usage of these technologies uh, that, for example, have enabled uh, fuel costs to be reduced uh, in tractors when the use of GPS technology for steering uh, is, is adopted. Uh, or the use of um, uh, reduction in, in, in water usage and water savings uh, up to 65% by using uh, artificial intelligence and other technologies to reduce water consumption. The use of LED lights, for example, in, in, in horticultural applications have the ability to um, reduce energy input by something between 40 and 75% when compared to traditional lighting systems. So not just on a trial basis, but also on a practical operational benefit uh, basis, many of these technologies are re resulting in quite significant improvements in yield, uh, improvements in efficiency, or reduction in cost across quite a broad range of agricultural segments. Uh, at the same time, many of these technologies are actually providing you know, quite disruptive impact on the particular areas that they serve. Uh, the use of uh, technologies like crop sensors and, and equipment telematics, vertical farming, water conservation technology, synthetic biology, uh, are you know, important across quite a broad range of different areas. And we're finding uh, these are examples of a, a broader range of uh, technologies that are being used across the agricultural sector. So not just specific to digitization, but also more concept-based approaches like vertical farming, uh, digital and non-digital water conservation technologies and even the use of synthetic biology are all contributing to digital disruption uh, or more broad technology disruption across the agricultural sector. And there are quite a broad range of companies involved in these different technologies. So, you know, in areas like crop sensors and, and, and equipment telematics, we've got some of the major tractor producers like John Deere, but also a broad range of other players. Uh, in areas like agricultural robots, we've got uh, companies in Australia like Swarm Form, uh, Swarm Form uh, as well as Swarm Farm, should I say, as well as air, uh, companies like Terranis and Harvest Automation in the US. And a broad range of plays in some of the other technologies as well. So across these technologies, we're finding uh, providers of point solutions, but also some of the larger, uh, broader companies like Hitachi, Telstra, IBM are all interested in investing in many of these particular technology solutions. And the innovations ecosystem in Australia for digital technology in, in includes quite a broad range of players. Uh, many academic um, institutions, universities and research laboratories are investing uh, in um, digital technology, digital solutions for agriculture. But of course, many companies as well, uh, technology solution providers, um, as well as end users are investing in this particular technology. Uh, we're finding government funding agencies uh, and also what you might call system integrators, all part forming part of this innovation ecosystem. It's also leading to uh, new ways of doing things, what you might call new business models, uh, particularly through the use uh, of, uh, of data in, in, in an agricultural setting. And there are different industry participants, if you like, that are or could form as part of this value chain of what we might call data. Uh, the data originator, the data collector, uh, the potential for a data aggregator or data broker to form, as well as the provision of agricultural solutions from providers that make intelligent sense of some of this data through the use of artificial intelligence and other solutions. So data itself is becoming a more valuable commodity in the agricultural sector, and we're finding different types of company emerging to play a role in that particular data value chain. Uh, another example of an uh, emerging business model is what's known as equipment as a service, or EAS, uh, where um, farmers effectively might lease equipment rather than own it. Uh, it's a model that's ob obviously emerging in, in other parts of, uh, of, of life, you know, um, examples like Uber, for example, or car share schemes in, in um, our own particular um, personal transportation, but it's increasingly also being used in industrial applications and in agricultural applications. So the use of digital technologies to, to much extent is also enabling the development of new business models or service models, enabling uh, pr provision of services or equipment to the agriculturalist in a new and perhaps fairly innovative way. So finally, I'd just like to sort of wrap up by making a few points that we've sort of learned from our interaction with technology vendors as, long, uh, as well as with, uh, with, uh, with end users. Uh, and I think that perhaps there are four major points that I'd just like to make. You know, it's, I think Michael made the point earlier from an elder's perspective, and we would certainly reinforce this. Uh, just because you can do it doesn't make you, mean you should do it. It's not really about the device or the technology. It's around, does this technology enable a solution to a business challenge that exists on the farm? If it isn't a significant business challenge on the farm, then the technology doesn't really provide a, a, an innovation. Uh, it's nice to have, but it's not really something that w would be important to invest in. Uh, 
from a solutions provider perspective as well, we'd also say that providing a more holistic solution to widen the, 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 the use cases and the benefits to improve ROI is quite important, uh, as is the use of open protocols, open data, vendor agnostic partnerships and synergistic partnerships. So open data is becoming much more widely used in, in virtually all aspects of, of, of data these days. And certainly on an agricultural basis, we see the open data being a very important aspect of the implementation of digital solutions. Uh, and finally, I think as a producer, what we would advocate is partnering with an end-to-end -end solutions provider rather than a series of individual point solutions providers, uh, particularly companies that perhaps uh, have a proven track record, that understand your business and that think long term. There are many small point solution providers, but certainly I think partnering with many of them could to some extent be risky and perhaps reduce the overall benefit that we would see from the implementation of digital technology, which is why we would certainly advocate in most cases partnering with a larger, broader end-to-end -end solutions provider. Uh, for the implementation of digital solutions on the farm. So thank you very much indeed for listening. We hope you found today's introduction uh, of interest and value, and I think perhaps it's helped to put into context much of what you'll hear in the resulting presentations today and the presentations and some of the vendors next door. Thank you very much indeed.